Okay, we're live. So I'm just going to tell everyone who's watching us live now uh, online that uh, we're here at Onward Gospel Church in Montreal. And we're going to deviate off course from what we've been doing in Ottawa. We're in Second Peter in Ottawa uh, on Sunday mornings. And today we're going to look at uh, actually the title of the message. I made a mistake. Will you forgive me? It's, uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> Four cups minus three cups equals one cup. Not four cups minus two cups equals two cups. There's only one cup. And you'll see what I mean in a moment or three. But um, before we look at God's word, overcome any um, connection difficulties online and, and all the other things that go along with that. We ask that you would protect and keep us uh, as we meet here in this place, and we pray in the authoritative name of Jesus that your Holy Spirit would guide and direct in everything that is said and done, and ask that uh, you would oversee in what we're looking at today in your word. And perhaps uh, one person might be looking in today. Perhaps one person may be sitting here in this room who does not know you as personal Savior, and we would pray that you would guide and direct them to know you. And pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you turn, please, to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26. We're going to read first, before we do anything, we're going to read from verses 17 to 30. I will read. You will follow along, I hope. Um, if you have your Bibles with you, it's good to follow along with your Bible. Some people now have, you know, electronic Bibles. That's okay. I like an old-fashioned Bible, something that you can mark up and put uh, notes in the margins and whatever. And um, just whatever your preference is, all I'm saying to you is read your Bible every day, whether it's electronic or in the, uh, held in a paper and book form in front of you. So Matthew chapter 26, starting at verse 17, follow with me, please. Now, on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is near. I am to keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. The disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. Now when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve disciples. As they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you that one of you will betray me. Being deeply grieved, they each one began to say to him, Surely not I, Lord. And he answered, He who dips his hand with me in the bowl is the one who will betray me. The Son of Man is to go just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. And Judas, who was betraying him, said, Surely it is not I, Rabbi. And Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself. And while they were eating, Jesus took some bread. And after a, after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and, gave, and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Four cups, the Passover and the Lord's Supper. And this is the template by which we have our um, Lord's table. Communion is what we call it. Now, there are four cups presented in this passage, whether you can see four cups or not, but they are there, and I'll show you where in a minute. But there also are three other elements. And the elements are the important elements of what you find on the Passover table. Now, we have a communion table. Table or not, call it whatever you want, it is the Lord's table. In a couple of weeks' time from yesterday, we will be celebrating Passover in our home. Now, we're Jewish believers, as you heard from Hillary. We still remember and celebrate the Passover. Read in Exodus chapter 12, I think it's verse 14. It's an ordinance that is given to me to remember forever. Now, some of you may think, well, I want to do what Jesus did, and I want to live just like Jesus did. And some people end up getting involved in what today is referred to as 
Messianic Judaism, and I am not a Messianic Jew. I am a Jewish person. I'm a Hebrew. Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3, the initiation of the Abrahamic covenant. God told Abram, I'll make from you a great nation, not a great religion. And the practices that you find in, quote, traditional Judaism are rabbinic. And this is not rabbinic Judaism here in this gospel account, nor any of the four gospel accounts. By the way, as a quick side note, the gospels are the end of the Old Testament. We have them in our New Testament, but it's the end of the Old Testament. The temple is still standing. Offerings are still being brought. The priesthood is in place. But there is a transition that's going to come, and that you find in the book of Acts, and that's for a whole other time to talk about. But we have a brochure that explains the whole thing about being a Messianic Jew and being a Jewish believer in Jesus. My nationality is that I'm a Hebrew. That brochure is on the table in the back. Hillary and I will be there later, along with a lot of other material that's there, including if you want to be on our mailing list, you can take this brochure, and there's a tear-off there, and you can leave us your email address. But I'm not a Messianic Jew. I'm a Jewish person, my nationality being I'm a Hebrew, Genesis 12, verse 2, that I'm a Hebrew who knows who the Messiah is, who was promised, as Romans 1.16 says, first to Israel, but I always paraphrase it, never to the exclusion of anybody else. Now, aside from Hillary and I, who are Jewish people, I don't know if there are any other Jewish people in this room. And if there are, great. But I would dare say that the majority in this room are not Jewish, right? Okay. Well, that's all right, because the church is God's called out people. The church is not a building. The church is God's called out people. The word iglesia in the Greek, and here we are in Montreal, Quebec, c'est la ville de France et de Canada, oui? And um, you have an église on almost every corner in Quebec, right? Iglesia, église, it's not buildings, it's God's people. Here are God's people, Jesus, God in the flesh. He's sitting with his disciples and he's showing them things that they are going to remember and know about later on after his death, burial, and resurrection. Another quick aside, one of the most interesting things I always find is that when Easter and Passover coincide on the same dates, and it happens like that this year. But all that to say that here we have in this Passover meal here, one of the most important and holiest days in the Hebrew calendar, we have four elements that appear on every single Passover table. The first one you find in verses 17 and 19, where it says, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And then again, it says, Jesus had directed them and they prepared the Passover. That's simply an English way of saying the Passover lamb. The interesting thing is that Jesus will become the ultimate and final Passover lamb that was the ultimate and final and perfect uh, giving of himself, the final sacrifice for the sins of all people. The lamb would be, would be put aside on the 10th day of the month and then four days later would be the Passover. And that lamb had to be singled out from the rest of the flock. It had to be kept and, and protected that it wouldn't have one flaw upon it. It was literally like almost a newborn in some respects. And then on the 14th day in the evening, they would cut the throat of the lamb, the blood would be poured out into a basin, and then it would be, and the first Passover, the only real Passover took place, it was painted on the two, lintel, uh, the two doorposts and the lintel, and there's a picture of the cross there, a foreshadowing of what would happen later on, about, oh, I'd say about 1,500 years later. And Jesus remembered the Passover as Israel had been instructed to never forget what God had done for them. Now, not only was there the Passover lamb in verse 19, but in verse 23, we have here the bowl. And he is announcing to them, he's saying, one of you is going to betray me. And this bowl is the bowl that contained bitter herbs. So the second element on the Passover table is bitter herbs. Now these herbs were given as an example of the bitterness of slavery in Egypt. 
Now let's move on and I'll show you in a few moments why the bitter herbs aren't even on our community, communion table. And in verse 26, we have the third element that you have to have on the Passover table, and that is the bread. This would be unleavened bread. This is matzah, and that's what unleavened bread is. It's referred to by some of the rabbis as the bread of affliction. And I always say it like this, eat that stuff for eight days and you'll see how it afflicts your, your gut. You're allowed to laugh, by the way, in church. And then in verses 27 and 28, the fourth element is there, and that is the wine. It says here that they, he gave them a cup, and he says, drink from it, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So there's the picture of the blood of the covenant. This fourth cup is important to understand in a certain specific way, and I'll explain that in a few moments. Now, this is the fourth cup. And the reason why we know it's the fourth cup, because immediately after verse 29, it says, after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And I'm going to show you in a few moments again what that hymn is. And it's not something you find up on the screen here or in a book that's in front of you in the pew. It's Psalms 113 through 118. The book of Psalms is the hymn book of Israel. And if you sing the Psalms, you're singing the hymn book of Israel. So knowing all of that here, here are four elements that appear on the Passover table that must be there. And as we looked at these things and we understand what they are all about now, let's look at what these four cups of wine represent. The first cup is called the cup of blessing. It's not mentioned here. We only have the fourth cup mentioned to us as I specific, specific, specified a moment ago. This fourth, the first cup is called the cup of sanctification. Now that word sanctification means to set apart. It's also called in the Hebrew the Kiddush or the Kiddush, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And this is the cup of sanctification. It's a promise that God was setting apart his people. It's also understood by those who take, partake of a Passover meal that you're setting apart this meal as being a very special and uh, important remembrance. You are supposed to remember through the reading of the Haggadah, which is the telling forth of what it means. It's a book that's been, booklet that's been prepared by various rabbis over the centuries. They had no Haggadah. I believe they read from the book of Exodus personally, but we don't have any proof of that. But that's what I personally believe they read. And then when you read this, the rabbis today say you are supposed to read and understand and experience as if you are coming in the exodus out of Egypt yourself by sitting at this meal. And all of these elements speak to that and tell you about this. But the important thing is it all points back to God. Now, in Exodus, Jesus was not there. But you see pictures of him throughout the book of Exodus. One thing that Hillary left out of her testimony, and it's not a fault or anything, but I remember her telling me. When we left from her parents' home after Passover, just following a few months after her, she became a, a believer. She became a believer in August 1978, and this would have been sometime April of 1979. And she had sat at that night at, at her parents' Passover table uh, or with friends in Utremont. Can't remember exactly where, but the important thing is we got in the car to go home, and she said to me, I can't believe that they can't see the Messiah in the Passover. And that's what happens when the Holy Spirit comes inside opens your eyes, and you can see. And there's a reason why this book is called The Living Word of God. Because when the Holy Spirit is inside of you, and it interacts between you and the living word on the page in front of you, suddenly you read something, and it makes sense. And throughout the Haggadah, yes, there's a lot of things written by rabbinic sources in there, but the scriptures are often uh, presented and quoted directly. And how can you not see the Messiah? in the Passover is how we see it. But the thing is, we can see it as Hebrew Christians, believers in Jesus. We see it because as the scriptures say, our eyes have been opened. But we are burdened for our own people of the house of Israel who still have kind of a blind eye. But there is hope one day. There is an all of Israel as Paul says in the book of Romans. And that is one third of the house of Israel in Zechariah chapter 13, who will look on him whom they have pierced, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. And at the end of all time, there's going to be a remnant of the house of Israel. That's the all Israel who 
will run to him. I sometimes wonder if that event's going to take place sometimes around, sometime around the Passover. At a time when this particular meal is set apart by this first cup. Now that first cup is not on the communion table. We have another cup on the communion table. Let's look at the second cup. The second cup is the cup of deliverance. In the Hebrew, it's makot. And you recite, you re- recite certain things out of the uh, communion, uh, out of, excuse me, the communion, out of the Haggadah, and it speaks about the things that specifically happened to Israel, and specifically the deliverance that Moses was promised when he was sent by God. And specifically in Exodus 3, verses 19 and 20, it's on the screen up there for you to look at if you wish. Don't look at it now, perhaps, if you want to, but make note of it and go home later today and read it and make sure that what you heard from me is the truth. But here, God tells Moses, you go and tell him. You go and tell Pharaoh about what he's going to do. And you will, he will be compelled to do what I'm telling you he is going to do. Moses didn't even believe it. Here he stood in front of this burning bush that continued to burn but wasn't consumed. And he's, he's saying, well, who should I say has sent me? And later on, God, when he has asked that question in that same portion in Exodus, God looks, God looks, God says, speaks to Moses and tells them, tells him, tell them, tell Pharaoh that I am has sent you. You know what that means in the Hebrew? Literally, the self-existing one. God exists. He has always existed. He's always going to exist. Now, you may say to me, well, how can you prove that? Well, I can't. I don't know how to prove it. Is God infinite, unending? Yes. Are we finite in our current condition because of sin? Yes. There's only so much we can comprehend. The scriptures also say that one day we'll be with him in heaven. We'll look at him and we'll understand and we'll see him and know him for who he is. That will happen. So some people who are skeptics might say to you, how can you believe something like that? That, that, you know, what proof do you have? Well, here's my proof. Hebrews 11 verse 1. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for, the substance of things not yet seen. Now, I haven't seen Jesus. Anyone in this room seen Jesus? If you've seen Jesus, you should be called an apostle. There are no apostles today. Jesus does not appear. But you are a believer in him. And how do you know? Because you read in this book. And the evidence that has been shown to you and given to you, you have believed. And because you have believed it, God imparts faith to you. And the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. And by the way, the Holy Spirit seals you permanently. You belong to him permanently. Uh, Hands up. Anyone in this room not sinned this week? No hands go up. Neither did mine. But because of grace, God's unmerited favor to you, to me. All he says is, have you sinned? Ask for forgiveness. And he is just, he is righteous, and he forgives of sin. You find that in 1 John chapter 1, verses 3 through 10. Read that passage. It's written to Christians, believers, followers of Jesus. That's what Christian means. It's the Greek word Christianos, follower of Messiah. It's not the Christian religion. It's not the Jewish religion. It's being a believer in the God of creation the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who said he would bring salvation through the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to all the nations of the world, not just to Israel, but all the nations of the world. He delivered Israel. And if he could deliver Israel, he can deliver you. The third cup is called the cup of redemption. And this cup would be drunk or taken down right at the uh, uh, the end of eating the meal. After the second cup, you would eat the Passover meal. Now here, and on, on the on the on the passage we have here, in the passage we have here, the the meal is very simple. 
It's a Passover lamb, the bitter herbs, unleavened bread, and four cups of wine. If you come to our house in two weeks' time, you will roll out the door because Jewish people eat a lot more than what you see on the page here. And I blame my wife for that. <laughs> she was brought up well in a cultural Jewish home, as you heard. The cup of redemption at the end of the meal speaks to how God redeemed his people out of slavery in Egypt. You've been redeemed. To be redeemed means for someone to pay on your behalf. The word in the Greek New Testament is ex agorazo, to pay on the behalf of somebody else. You've been paid for. Your sin has been covered, taken away by the very one who sits here in this passage and doesn't take the fourth cup, which I'll explain to you in a moment. If you have accepted Jesus as personal savior, your sins are taken away. Forever, as I explained, because you're sealed permanently by the Holy Spirit, it can't be taken from you. You cannot lose your salvation. Well, there are a lot of questions. Some people will say, what about a, a wayward child? Well, we, we have three sons. You can find out, uh, you can ask us about them. I can tell you this, that sometimes they didn't do exactly everything we hoped they would do. And um, it's not that they went way off course, but uh, they, a couple of them gave us some interesting experiences and, and at times. And you see my hairline is proof of that. <laughs> But the two of them who have married have married believing ladies. And our son, who is our lifetime project, as my wife calls, it, calls him, Joshua, is a believer in Jesus. And we bear proof of the fact that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved and so will your house, Acts chapter 16. And so we are always been this different family in church on Sunday and a whole Jewish family shows up. There have always been Jewish people in the church and there's always going to be Jewish people in the church and don't let anyone in the Jewish community tell you otherwise. But then again, be kind and gentle when you respond to them. And that's why we teach Jewish evangelism and I'd be happy to do that here with you as well. This third cup of redemption speaks to being redeemed out of the slavery from Egypt. You have been redeemed out of the slavery to sin. It's been paid for. You are no longer a slave to the world. You're no longer a slave to sin. You have the authority in the name of Jesus to rebuke the enemy who would come around any time he possibly could to try and tempt you. No temptation comes from God, as the book of James tells us. But what do you do when that temptation comes? You say, in the name of Jesus, be gone. And you have the authority to do that. Take it up and do it. In Luke chapter 22, verse 20, it speaks about the cup saying, this is the cup that's poured out for you. This is a new covenant in my blood. And this is the cup that's spoken about here in Matthew chapter 26. And Jesus doesn't take this fourth cup. The fourth cup, as it's spoken of, he won't take because it's the cup. Some recall it the cup of restoration. The Hallel is, is sung. The Hallel, as I already spoke to you, is Matthew, uh, is Psalms 113 through 118. They're also referred to as the Psalms of Ascent, to ascend, to go up to Jerusalem. Jesus celebrated this Passover in Jerusalem and within 24 hours was hanging on a Roman cross as it was prophesied would happen. Everything that happened to Jesus, his death, his burial, his resurrection was prophesied. I've read that the odds of all those things happening to the letter of the word as spoken of by the Hebrew prophets to one person at the right time, at the right place in history are gazillions to one, as Forrest Gump might call it. Because it's almost improbable to think of it as happening like that. But it did. He didn't take this fourth cup. In John chapter 8, verse 58, he stood up in the temple in Jerusalem at the Feast of Sukkot. 
which was important and was symbolic to what he said to them there. When they said to him, who are you? And he looked at them and he said, before Abraham was, I am. Remember what I said moments ago about Exodus chapter 3 and the Passover? Who shall I say is sending me to Pharaoh? Tell him, I am is sending you. And when Jesus stood in the temple and declared that he is, I am, he is saying, I'm your God. I am God in the flesh. I am your Messiah. He fulfilled everything spoken of by Daniel the prophet in chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. He came at the right time in history, in the right place, at the right event. And he stood in front of his people and he said, I'm your God. And what did they say two chapters later later in John chapter 10 at the Feast of the Dedication in the temple in Jerusalem? The Feast of the Dedication is the Feast of Hanukkah, as it's referred to in the Hebrew. And what did they, they came and they said, if you're the Messiah, tell us plainly. Well, just two chapters earlier in the Gospel of John, he said, before Abraham was, I am. How much more plain can you be? And they rejected him. And they plotted to have him murdered, put, us, put away because he would upset the apple cart of their relationship with the Roman Empire. And that's all they wanted was to be able to retain their religious sway, the uh, high priests and the priesthood of Israel at that time, and just keep the peace. And this guy was a troublemaker. He certainly was in his own way, because he is God. And he was going to deal with the trouble in this world, which is sin. And he dealt with it. But before he did, he had to come first to his own people as the, he spoke to uh, his, the 70 he sent out in the Gospel of Matthew. And he said, don't go into the way of the Gentiles, but go first to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and tell them the kingdom of God is at hand. And this is the, the point. Had all of Israel accepted Jesus at the time that he was there the first time, the kingdom would have come in then. And where would you be? You would be outside of it because the kingdom was for Israel. But Israel, because of God's promise, had to receive the promise first. I'll send you one like a prophet unto Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 18. And he came at the right time in history, as Daniel the prophet said in chapter 9. And he did everything that was spoken of by him, as Isaiah and Jeremiah and all the other prophets said he would do. And just like it says in Isaiah chapter 52, starting in verse 13 through to all the end of chapter 53 of Isaiah, he was put to death, but not for himself, but for others. That's where you and I come in. Yeah, my people have rejected him, but it's temporary. And Israel is not done with God yet, and God is not done with Israel. And he is one day going to restore them, as Zechariah the prophet says, that one third I mentioned earlier on. They will run to the pierced one. They look at him as the pierced one. I remember the first time I ever read that, and I said to myself, how can they not recognize who the Messiah is? But still they do, because of hard hearts. By the way, there are hard hearts, not just in Israel. There are hard hearts in Israel every nation group on this planet. And so what do we need? You need, we need to pray that the gospel goes forward and that God may open up and soften hard hearts. Now, this fourth cup, Jesus didn't take it. It's the cup of acceptance. And the reason why he didn't take it is because Israel had rejected him at that point in history. And he says here, this is my blood. Look at verse 28 of Matthew uh, 26. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it, it, drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. You know what I think that's going to happen? I think after the rapture of the church, after we are all taken to be with the Lord in heaven, sometime after that will come the judgment on planet earth that this Passover meal, which I believe is in suspension, the meal doesn't finish until that fourth cup is taken. And the leader of the house takes the fourth cup. And as he drinks, then everyone else drinks. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break the tradition here. I'm not taking it. You drink it because you've accepted me. They were all Jewish men in front of him. You, this remnant of the house of Israel, you take this cup. 
you drink it. I'll take it with you in heaven when this time is up. And that time would become known as the church age. And we're in the church age. And it will end with the rapture of the church. Now, some of you don't believe in the rapture. And some of you have heard me say this before. You're going to go in the rapture whether you like it or not. (laughs) And it won't be a bad thing either. And then when we get to heaven, we'll be the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I believe that that's when we will take the fourth cup with him because all of those who have accepted him will be there and all will take the cup of acceptance or restoration, however you want to refer to it is. Israel was restored to God and brought into the land eventually. You have been restored to God here and now and will be brought to a better land as the book of Hebrews speaks to and you'll be with God forever. You know how long forever is? It's forever. And that's a long time. And don't you want to spend forever with God instead of somewhere else? Because that somewhere else is a place called hell. Nobody likes to preach about hell anymore, but I'm going to. It's a real place. Jesus referred to it. Jesus is I am. He is God. And that's the place that's been put aside for those who reject him. And you do not want to go there. Read about hell. Just look up the words Hades. Find a good concordance and look up the word Hades or Sheol or hell and see how it's described. It's real. You don't want to go there. You want to go to be with God forever. It's simple. How are you born again? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved and all of your house. That's a promise. And God keeps his promises. So, The fourth cup wasn't taken. They sing the great Hallel, the Psalms of Ascent, Psalms 113 through 118. But what I want to read with you specifically is, and I want you to turn to the book of Psalms, please, and I want you to find Psalm 118. I want to read with you what is read at the end of the Passover meal, specifically from verses 22 to verse 29. At the end of the great Hallel, and when he, he would have sung this or recited this with his disciples. And it is, it is in, the, in the very re, uh, observant religious Jewish homes. And I grew up in one like that for a period of my growing up. This is sung. This is read. We read it in the Hebrew. And you're taught to read Hebrew, not really to understand it. And it says this. Look at verse 22 and follow with me. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Wherever you read in the scriptures, the stone, it refers to the stone as being God. And the, the chief, uh, the builders would have been the religious leadership of Israel, as we would call it. And they rejected him at this point in history. And he's reading and singing of himself in this place. Verse 23, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The day is not, some people sing this as a, as a chorus and they, we're in church on Sunday and this is the day the Lord has made. Every day is the day the Lord has made. But this specifically speaks to the day that was set aside in all of human history where God himself would lower himself, take on human form and willingly go to be executed in your place. That is the day. O oh Lord, verse 25, do save, we beseech you. O oh Lord, we beseech you, do send prosperity. And then this, verse 26, and Jesus recites this at the end of Matthew chapter 23. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And he recites this as he pronounces his declaration of, of condemnation upon the city of Jerusalem because they had rejected him at that point. And then he goes on in verse chapters 24 and 25 of Matthew and speaks about the future for Israel and how God will deliver Israel. Verse 26, we have blessed you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God and he has given us light. Bind the festival sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. Well, that could be seen as the Passover lamb. But Jesus would be bound to the horns of a very different altar. A Roman cross. 
one of the most hideous forms of execution ever devised. And then he's saying this, you are my God I, and I give thanks to you. You are my God, I extol you. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Just the previous verse, he's speaking about his own execution. And then how does he close off with it? He says, thank you, Lord God. It's a picture of obedience. God, the Son, is no different than God the Father, who is no different than God the Holy Spirit, who willingly be to lowered himself to become a human being like you and, me, you and me. I've often referred to it like this. The most amazing thing that has ever happened in all of human history is that God became a human being like you and I and willingly allowed himself to be taken to that cross to be tortured and executed and publicly humiliated in your place and mine. And he sang about himself here, knowing what was coming. Going to the Garden of Gethsemane right after this event in Matthew chapter 26. Go back to this. Because after singing that, in verse 30, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And it was there that he prayed. And it was there that he was arrested. And it was from there that he went to his execution. All in the Passover. Now I want to make a quick comparison to the communion table, which is not before us today. But the next time you take communion, I, want, I hope that I've impressed upon you what is on the table in front of you. When you take communion next time, you're taking one cup, not four, one. And it's the cup of acceptance. It's because you're an accepted, you've accepted Jesus as personal savior. And you're taking if it's a piece of matzah, if it's a piece of bread, it doesn't matter. It's symbolic. But you're taking what was broken, the bread that was broken, and you are taking an, in a symbolic way of what was done to Jesus. You're saying, I have accepted you. Now, you know what? On your, our communion table, one cup of wine, some bread, no bitter herbs, no Passover lamb. You know why? It's very simple. The bitter herbs of, slave, of slavery to sin have been taken away. What you have is the cup of acceptance because of the broken body of Jesus. And not only have the bitter herbs been taken away, but you have eternal life. And you have no need of a Passover lamb because in his, as it says in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, he sits at the right hand of God in heaven. So there are four lessons from Matthew today that we're going to take. And they're simply this. Jesus is that final Passover. The bitterness of sin is gone. The Passover is in heaven. The Passover lamb is in heaven. Hebrews 1 verses 1 to 4. And he is coming back. And perhaps it is today. Do you know why he's coming back as he promised? Because everything of uh, points one, two, and three on the screen in front of you have happened exactly as they said he said it would happen. He's coming back. My question to you is, do you know Jesus as personal Savior? I usually presume that on most Sundays, wherever I am to speak, whether it be here or back in Ottawa, that the people in front of me are followers of Jesus. I don't know. I can only presume, but I'll never be so presumptuous to think that there might be one person perhaps looking in right now or later on when it, it'll appear on our webpage and it'll be, this message will be there for a number of days, www.ihopecanada.org or on our, one of our community pages, Israel's Hope Bible Church on Facebook where this is being broadcast from. The important thing is, do you know Jesus as Savior? Have you made a decision about him? Where are you going to spend eternity? And if you've made that decision, what are you doing for him today and this week coming? Because he could come for us today or this week coming. Are you ready to go to be with Jesus? Father God, thank you for the privilege to come and speak to these people here today. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for eternal life in him. 
Thank you for causing us to know you because you have drawn us to you. And thank you now for doing what you've done so that we can have eternal life. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.